One Percenter Podcast with Sam Bakhtiar, bringing you the one percent knowledge to help you reach your full potential. Learn what it takes to rise above the 99 percent and become a one percenter. Hi, guys, welcome to the One Percenter Podcast. This is your host, Sam Bakhtiar, and I have with me right now a serial entrepreneur, an immigrant who came to the United States with a single mom, and all he knew how to do is work. He actually utilized every second, every minute, and he started hustling. And what he's big on is by being in the present and not forgetting the present, because a lot of people, just what we do as entrepreneurs is we're always looking to the future, and we, lost, we lose what we need to do in the present. The king of leverage, Pesman Kajimi, welcome. I appreciate you having me on. Of course, man. So I'm fascinated with your story because we have a lot of similarities, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, tell me about a little story, because I know I came to America. We were, the same, we were from the same country, Iran. Right. You know, I was born in Tehran, Iran, mm -hmm. and I came to United States in 1985 when I was 11. We kind of escaped the war with my, with, with, uh, with my single mom. It's crazy because in our culture, like, you don't see too many single moms. It's like they don't get divorced. Right, you know, right, yeah, like yeah. That. So I know that, that that was a big deal. Can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. So I came, well, I left. Iran, I think it was about 19, I want to say 86, okay. uh, 85, 86. And uh, we were trying to come to the United States, but obviously that, yep. that door was closed. Yeah, you, can, you can't go straight to the <laughs> United States. That door was closed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so we ended up in France. Uh, and France itself was very different because my mom, you see, we were pretty well off in Iran, mm -hmm. meaning like we, my uh, grandpa was like some colonel under the, in the army and stuff. Mm -hmm. and. They had ties to the Shah and everything. So we were well off, not like super rich, but we had servants, we, we lived well. So when we left Iran, my mom uh, wasn't really doing that well with my dad, but my dad was in a good standing with the government, didn't have any issues. Uh, he ran a bank, but my mom on the other side worked for a weapons company that worked for the government. And as the government changed, that became a big deal. Mm -hmm. So she was actually being tried for treason. Uh, and so she was about to get and literally executed and yeah. before that happened we fleed you know to Turkey and then eventually ended up in France and so what was supposed to happen was my dad was supposed to stay behind sell my mom's assets and whatever she had so that we could all live in France and continue living yeah. and uh, w unfortunately what ended up happening is he kind of had a different plan just didn't share it yeah and so my mom left and was expecting her money to get there and kind of surviving and a month after we moved there we realized there's no money coming there's no dad coming so it wasn't a bad thing, you know, all that happened well, is, a bad thing. well, you know, <laughs> well, it was, it was a horrible thing for the moment, for the right? Moment, for the moment, moment, right? But I always say sometimes life seems harsh now, but we don't realize its impact until 10 years oh, later when we look back and we go, oh my God, like, I'm so glad this happened. And, and I'll tell you what was really interesting is that when I go back, like I met my dad for the first time when I was about 30. 31 or so in Dubai, like he couldn't come to the States. So I went to Dubai and he wanted to meet me. So I was like, sure, I'll talk to you. And one of the things that I realized is a lot of people were like, are you going to be angry? Are you going to be, you know, mad that he left your mom? And I said, not really. Like, I don't, I don't care. Like I never looked at it as it's my dad. Hey, you made it. You, yeah. You I just look at it as it. like, it's a dude, you know, like he made his choice, right? It's not a bad choice. It was a choice for him, you know? But one of the things that happened is when I got, like when I met him, I realized that his mindset is so structured around boundaries of like, you have to go to school, you have to be this, you have to do that, that I realized like my life would have been fucked, forgive me for saying, if, yeah. if I would have been in that environment. You know, even yeah. if he would have been in France or in, in the United States, it would have always been this, this control mechanism that was the opposite that would have, of my that would, have, that would have limited you. Yeah, like that would have prevented yes, yes, me from yes. ever being any type yes. of success. Because you didn't degree. go to college or anything like that. You're no, a at all. You know, multi-millionaire, and, and you're a firm believer in being a lifetime learner rather than rather than just going to college and being within these four walls. Well, I think what college provides people that I think we as a culture in the United States, or or even in around the world, are f like force ourselves to learn. Meaning, we need to be forced to learn because people don't want to learn. So I think what college does for people is it gives them a way to, to force that learning mm -hmm. and to say, I'm incapable of learning on my own. Yeah. So I need someone to tell me what to learn, you know, cause I just don't, I'm not self-sufficient. Yeah. Now, in some cases where you have to learn medicine, law, and some of the baselines that require you to, to operate within society on other people or around other people, then yes, there's a need for some certification from a college. Makes perfect sense. 
I, you would expect it. I wouldn't want a doctor to come yeah. operate me if you didn't have three degrees from Harvard or something, you know. But at the same time, I think that we have become so like leveraged on this idea of learning by force yeah. that it becomes the easier thing to do. You know, it's like, hey, I'm out of high school. Instead of figuring out a plan, this is the easy route to take, which is just go there and continue to do what I do. And because of that, then our expectations around learning also change. It's like, well, I'm paying this, so I'm entitled to a job. And it's like, well, well not really. Know. You know, like that's not how that works. Bro, so. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, with me, you know, my mom was that controlling one. You know, because you know, my dad wasn't around. My mom was asked me. I don't remember. Like, you know, my mom was like, in life, the typical Persian mother. You have to be either <laughs> either a doctor, lawyer, engineer, because if you're not any of those, you might as well just. You know, you know, being a bazaar. Right. You know what I mean? You know, that's that's what they tell you, right? And then she moved, she walked away, and she says, "You know what?" And I prefer a doctor. And I knew that I didn't want to operate on people. I knew that I didn't want to drill somebody's teeth. So that's why I went, I went and got my degree, thinking that. But when I get my degree, you know, money is just gonna come. That's that. That was that was what was the painted picture yeah, for me. Exactly. You know. And then all of a sudden, you know, I get this diploma. I'm in credit card debt, I'm in student loan debt, and all these creditors are calling me. I'm like, hey, I'm a doctor, where's the money? Mm -hmm. You know, but what they don't teach you is about grit, about perseverance, mm -hmm. is about business, marketing, and be able to just set your own path. Well, you know, I think education gives you survival, yeah. practice gives you leverage, yeah. you know, and, so and that's one of the big disconnects for people is that it, this is the same disconnect people have about education in general. They believe education or in any degree is sense to help them uh, like be successful in life when really education is there to help you survive. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things they don't, when I say education, I mean formal education okay. to, be, to be fair. I think one of the things people don't understand is that they think that the government and the school system is built to help them succeed when in reality it's population control because then the government gets to put people four years to college as students mm -hmm. and they don't have to enter the workforce. So the unemployment rates stay. I never thought of fair. it that way. So think that about it, like sense. all they're doing is delaying like the entry into the workforce for people that yeah. would have nowhere to go. So yeah. instead of collecting unemployment, being lost, being whatever, they're like, well, those people won't count. You know, so we have X amount. That's why the education system is being caught on now where people are like, oh, I'm not going. And, and colleges are struggling and they're raising rates because they're like, well, we just, that, Equation is no longer a one-to-one. -one also, anymore. times are changing. You know, I think right, you know, exactly. education was for the industrial age. Exactly. You know, right. where, where you had to know a certain skill to work for a certain. Hundred percent. Exactly. And now we're not in this industrial age. We're That's in, over. We're yeah. in the information age. Yeah. You know. So you know. So one of the on one of the interviews I was watching you, you said that you, you only knew one thing, that you didn't want to be broke. <laughs> That's all I knew when I was a kid, you know, <laughs> you know I didn't know I, what I wanted to do. <laughs> and, and, and I was dying, you know, and it's so true, you know, it's like, you know, all I knew, and I wanted to be broke, you know, I knew that, that's all I knew, that was my goal, not to be broke, and I was, then, I put a plan to maximize every hour, every second mm -hmm. to be able to do it. Yeah. I remember you saying something like, you know, you were working as, at a telemarketing company, mm -hmm. you know, and then in between breaks, you were washing cars, and you were figuring out yeah. how, to, how to do that, you know. A lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people, you know, when I was watching your interview, I was like, well, a lot of people don't understand that. It's all about maximizing what's in front of you right now. Not, you know, I'm all about the big picture stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm all about having setting big goals and all that kind of stuff. But you set a big goal and you reverse engineer it to every second of every day of what you have to Correct. do. Yeah. Is that what you did? That's exactly what I do. And I think one of the big mistakes other people make towards their own goals is that they're more concerned about making a million dollars than they're concerned about making $5,000 <laughs> when they don't have $5,000. But what they don't realize is that in order to make a million, you have to first make 5,000. So they're so focused on, I need a plan to make a million dollars that breaks down the path being so far from reality, you know, which is like a normal person would look at it and, and sit there and be like, well, I need to make, I want a company that makes $10 million. And I'm like, that's great. When have you built a company that made one sale at $100? And they go, well, what do you mean? Why would I want one sale at $100? Well, because you need to make one sale to time it by 6,000 a month to be in a position where in 10 years you say, I'm now making $10 million in my company. But I think it's so easy to get lost in this idea of big numbers that the small work doesn't look exciting anymore, right? It doesn't, but, but that's the small work that leads to the big numbers. So 
That's what people don't realize. So you know? this is a story of my life. This is a story of my. This is what I've been preaching. I thought I was the only one that thought. That no, I, I read your stuff on Instagram. And I'm like <laughs> fire emojis. You know, you know, it's it's crazy because I mean, you know, bodybuilding or fitness or weight loss is the same thing. You know, if I came up and said, you know, I want to lose, you know, let's say I was 100 pounds overweight and I want to lose 100 pounds, mm -hmm. you know. First of all, you're gonna be like, okay, 100 pounds by when? Right. Okay, and then how much I need to lose every month? How much I need to lose every week? How much I need to lose every day? And what do I need to do? What actions do I need to do? Yeah, what exercises, what machines, it. what, you know, Absolutely. what diet, etc. But I think it's easier to be excited about the 100, you know, pounds you wanna lose than to look at the six exercise machines that don't look exciting and be like, I need to not have that ice cream. I need to not have this. And I need to hit these six machines, 40 reps. And, and what happens though in the mind, right, is that the million dollars, the 100 pounds is exciting because we envision the result, right? And we say, well, if I had a million dollars, I would have this house, I would have this. But if we think about if I had a hundred dollars, well, nothing changes, right? It's like, like you wipe your ass with a hundred dollars, you're like, what do I do with this? But she needed to do a, get a hundred dollars. Right, right, exactly. But, but because it's not exciting and you can't relate it to a visual in your head, it doesn't compute as a necessity to getting to the million because everybody can spend a million in their head, but they can't spend a hundred dollars and actually, Get excited about that so they just don't even think about that and that's the mistake you know you know i have a, a thinking when i've when i've looked at success you know I've, I've i've came up to this conclusion i don't know if you agree with me or not my conclusion is that you if for you on the way to success you had to repeat it boring things to be able to get there yeah. you know what i mean if i want to you know you know you know get in a bodybuilding shape like i want to get the best you know i gotta have a plan to be able to follow. When a boxer is getting ready to get in the ring, they have a 12 week cycle of exactly what they need to do. Same more repetition, uh -huh. boringness to be able to get there, you know, and I think for success it's the same thing, but nobody is willing to put, do the non-sexy work. Everybody wants the sexy part, but they don't want to do the non-sexy part. Well, I mean, the non-sexy part is what leads to the sexy part, right? But I, th I think that's, again, flawed based on society constantly telling us you have to be passionate about what you do, which, it's true to some extent, you have to love kind of the idea of what you're about to do, right? But the path to getting there, you may not love every step of it, you know? A, a lot of people are like, well, I hate sales, so I'm gonna hire someone for that. I'm like, yeah, you're already done. Like, it's not gonna get anywhere. If the first thing you're saying is, as soon as I'm not good at something because I don't like it or it's not comfortable, well, the first thing I'm gonna do is hire someone else that's gonna take that discomfort away from me. I'm like, that's not how business works. Like, you're, you're not failed. there yet, brother. Yeah, you're not, you're <laughs> you're not, not there, there yet, brother. brother. You that, <laughs> you're brother. not so, there, brother. And, and you need to learn how to do that to then manage a team to do that. So if I didn't know sales, I couldn't build a sales team and say, here's some coaching about how we sell my product, right? Like, so I think one of the big things that, that people don't realize is that in order to get to the, to the light, you might have to walk through the dark. And, and the discomfort you experience in the dark, that's the test to who you become, right? That's the test that tells you that's the test that allows you to, to know when you get to the light that you're never going to go back to the dark because you're not afraid of it, right? But when people try to get to the light without the darkness, then any, any sign of darkness, they turn away from and they go, oh, well, this is a bad, this is, this is not going the right way. I'm just going to back up over there because it's comfortable over there. I'm going to hang over there. So what happens is when you're walking through that, that side of yourself that obviously most people who have gotten successful have walked through, especially when they built it themselves, right? You know, they didn't have the leverage that money brings, they had to bring it through sweat equity and everything else. They've gone through that process that's so uncomfortable where they've learned to live within the discomfort where they're not afraid of facing discomfort. And I think that's what happens, right? Is like when we're afraid of facing discomfort, we run away from it. We take away the commitment and we go, oh, it's something else is better. And I think that's what happens with young people that keep changing their minds on what they want to do. You know, they want to be in e-com, they want to do real estate, they want to do f trading, whatever it is. As soon as it gets uncomfortable, they go, wait, so well, well, that million dollars is across over there, but I, I don't want to cross here. It's very painful to go through here. So they go back and they go, well, let me try e-com. And at every stage, they're going to get to the same discomfort. Oh, yeah. And so they turn back and they don't realize that five years later, they're the same spot they were in five years ago. They should have just stuck with one thing and got it over there. Well, they, they should have learned to go through the pain, even if they didn't want to be a trader in the end. Yeah they should have still learned to master the art of trading only to get to a stage and say, I've tried this. It's not for me. You know, like I, I've done it and I've done good at it. I've learned something. It's just not for me, but I was good at it. I didn't run away from it. 
I got really good at it and I realized that even though I was good at it, I didn't want to commit the rest of my life to it. So I've also started a separate business now and I'm trending in this direction. I think that's what happened with your, with your car wash and car maintenance business. You know, you, you, you started that, you know, and you, you started leveraging it. You hired a couple of people, you know, and then you were like, you know what, this is it's as far as I want to go. You give it to the, to the workers and then you went to the next day. So, so two things happened there. The first one was I didn't have a green card when I started that. Yeah. Right, so that was fucked. <laughs> like, yeah, like, you don't have too many people going to No, I mean, like, I could I, I went to McDonald's. I was like, can I wash your floor for, like, three bucks? It was by my house. It was hey, like, immigration, oh. I hope you're not watching this. No, no I mean, we're okay now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're okay now with what's happening in the news, but we're okay. going to come back after that and get some taxes from you. <laughs> but, you know, I think one of the big things that happened there is, first off, I never wanted to be in the car wash business. It was by necessity. Yeah. Secondly, I realized there was money in it, so I stuck to it. And then, so when I got a chance to work, I didn't want to give it up because there was some money in it, so I assigned other people to do it, and I helped, right? It was actually what saved my life from even losing purpose after I got into banking, which made me a lot of money. Then, after I, I became a banker and I made a tremendous amount of money, I got fired from banking. And when I got fired from banking, one of the big things that happened to me is I had money, so I was already like well off. I had like seven figures, so I was like, okay, I have some cash, you know, I'm not poor, poor. They're not taking away my house, my car, you know, and my job's not the end now of it all, right? But, but what, I, what they took away from me was my purpose, right? Yeah. Because they, I was a really good banker and I liked being a banker, you know, like I really was good at it. Like well, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't be making seven figures if you yeah, wanted Yeah, exactly. I was really good at it. I understood leverage, people, you know, I was, I was the top banker in you know, almost the entire United States. So I was like really happy and I was really good. And then when they took that away from me, it took me like probably like, a, two, three weeks to realize what had happened. Cause I used to go to this like, uh, what do you call it? Like a fajita taco place, you know, that was nearby. And I had my Lamborghini parked up front and I was already fired, you know, but I was sitting here and I had Alan Greenspan's book in my hand. Cause I was like, oh, you know, I'm gonna take some time off and read. And every day I would go to the same place and I could read only the first three pages. For some reason, my mind wouldn't get past the first three pages and it would start wandering and doing shit. So I would sit there like seven hours staring at my car and reading the same three pages. And then I was, I still didn't even remember what was on the three pages. But what I realized after like being there for a couple of days was that I really didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, it wasn't that they took my money. I was like, I didn't even care because I wasn't in a rush to go sell my car or feel like, my God, I got to downgrade my life. I just felt like I don't know, like being no one else is going to hire me. I was like, I'm done, you know? So I was like, what can I do? And so I decided instead of being a victim and like sitting there and being like, I'm not going to do anything. I was like, at least I'll go back to the car wash, you know, and I'll wash cars again. And I didn't feel like, oh, I'm too good now, I make all this money. I said, well, now I have money, so let's do it bigger. Let's open a space and, and maybe detail cars and tune cars. And I have this car, everybody's asking me, where'd you get your exhaust? And this, and I said, all right, I'll do it there. And when I got there and I started that process, I bought commercial real estate, I started to kind of build out a, a shop, only to realize then that there was really no long-term plan in that. You know, it wasn't really what I wanted to do, but I said, I don't have something else. So instead of complaining about like, you oh, so. right. Instead of complaining about like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do and my passion in this. This is the same thing people suffer from today, right? They go, I have a job I hate. I, I work at the supermarket and I grow, I'm doing groceries. And I'm like, okay, well, do you want to work there forever? Like, no. They're like, that's why I don't put an effort. And I'm like, that's a problem because you committed to taking that job. Someone paid you $12 an hour, $10 an hour. And you said you would commit to picking up groceries and doing that. And now you're dishonoring yourself by not doing what other people are paying you, I right? Agree with you more yeah, so I did the same thing. I said, I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going to work. I'm not going to care what the prestige of it is. Fine, I'm not wearing a suit. Which is, which is huge because a lot of people, a lot of people, once they went to a certain level, they can't come back. A lot of people can't come back. You know, you set your ego on the side. You didn't have ego. And I, not, not, not to, not to you know, down, downgrade our culture, you know, especially Persians, no, right. yeah. especially Persians. There's I mean, pride there's that pride right. thing, you know, oh, I used to do this in Iran. I can't come and do this now here. But, you know, I didn't allow my title to define me. Yeah. I didn't allow my suit to define me. I just allowed my mental state to define me. And I said, I'm not going to let my mental state crash. So I went to do that. And because I did that, the universe kind of opened the door where I started getting contracts from larger dealerships to do wheels, et cetera, and make, you know, decent money, only to then realize that we were entering a recession. And then shit was going down and we were, we were about to lose all of our contracts. So I was like, shit, we got to do something. And so as a joke, I walked into the dealership and I was like, they were, I knew they were going to go out of business. So I was like, Hey, you should sell me cars at like 50 off, you know? And he's like laughing and he's like, Oh yeah, which ones you want? I was like, I'll buy them all. 
So he goes and talks to the owner, and I was like, what is he doing? Like, I was like, is he like, you seriously asking? <laughs> so I had like a total of like $2 million saved up, like from all these years. And what I did is he went and asked, and he's like, he won't do 50, he's like, he'll do 40. And I'm like, 40 off. I was like, really? Like, I was like, why don't you just sell them for 20 off? Like, I'm just like, I can't. I'm franchised, so I can't advertise that they're gonna sell at 20 off. So I go, well, I'm not franchised, I don't give a shit. I was like, I'll buy them, and then, I'll sell them. So I'm like really cocky and I'm like, I'll do it. Now, I don't know how to sell cars, right? Like, yeah, I don't, at that time, I know nothing you, you about it. You knew you were getting a deal. Yeah, I was like, this is... This I'll make it work. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll, I thought I'll, it was going to make it work, you know? So, so I buy all these cars, I take them to my warehouse and it's fantastic, right? I'm like, all right, so we have all these cars here sitting here. And then I'm like, wait, I just spent all my money as zero cash flow, as zero reserves now, and we now have all these cars sitting here. So then, then I started, started like really panicking because I was like, shit, what am I going to do? Like, this is now it's set in. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was like, okay, I have all these cars. I can't drive them, can't do anything with them. They're not even registered. You know, so I was like, okay. So I got an idea. I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I think they were a good investment because I think I can sell them eventually, right? So what I did is I took my list from my banking days, you know, of investors and stuff that we're going to need to pull out from the banking mm -hmm. with the crash. So I said, I have a different opportunity and it's investing cars. So they started kind of like, they're like, you're crazy. You know, like, why would we invest in cars? So there were two of them that said, okay. Like they were like, let's talk about it. So they came, they liked it. And that gave birth to our investment model, which was, you know, VIP motoring. So it gave birth from a car shop, or from a car wash to a car tuning shop to then an investment firm. So let's talk about that. You know, you have something called the exotic car hack. Mm -hmm. Okay, which, dude, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm I, you know, you're a big exotic car guy. I, 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 lo I love cars. I'm a mm -hmm. car enthusiast, you know. So let's talk about it. What, what do you, what do you teach in exotic car hacks, and why should people um, to to invest in that course? So exotic car hacks is an extension of what I do at VIP Motoring. VIP Motoring is helping take wealthy investors and do what I call wealth preservation. So we all, the, the richer you get, the more money you spend, right? And the more you want toys. Everybody wants them, even if they're frugal, they still want them. They just don't want to spend money on them. So if you want toys, then what you do usually is the conventional thinking tells you to go to the store. The more money you have, the nicer of a car you own. But one of the things that happens is you're also losing money. But in many cases, people are like, well, I make enough. I can afford to lose 100 grand a year. I don't care. And that's a very flawed mentality because you don't have to. And so one of the things that, you know, at VIP Motoring we did for very affluent members is that we would help them uh, create a portfolio of luxury assets from watches, cars, and art that would allow them to buy and hold and own cars, watches, and art as an investment instead of a liability. Now, it required $5 million minimum investment, you know, which was heavy, and not everybody has that kind of cash sitting around. And so over the years, we realized that there was such an audience of customers that would come to me and say, hey, I want to buy one Ferrari, I want to buy two Lamborghinis, I want to buy three Audemars Piguet watches, and I don't know like, like what, what to do, do? Could you help me? And, and so, so I was like, oh no, I'm sorry, I can't help you. You know, this is the minimum we have because I didn't want to overextend our, our portfolio and I couldn't. I didn't have the capacity to handle the clients. So instead of just then saying, I'm going to start a new foundation that's lower for people at entry level, I decided instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a self-taught course that people can take online to learn how the exotic car market works from an investment standpoint instead of from a liability, just buying a car, losing money on a car, or buying a lease because we are pre-programmed to think leases are a good idea, one of the worst things in the world. But one of the things that I was trying to do is create financial education around luxury assets, which would give normal people the ability, if they wanted to learn, to have wealth preservation within their own assets, you know, and how to do it. And so we, this gave birth to Exotic Car Hacks, and it's ultimately the power of understanding all the financial leverage that exists between banks, uh, margins on cars, understanding which models and so on and so forth are better investments than others and which are the right ones to invest in. And so all of that together gives a normal person who previously thought they could only afford a car that they could lease, now the power of the knowledge is in their hands to understand how the finances work around these things. And I don't just mean financing the car, I mean the finances of how the money flows in the equation. And as a banker, I felt the more educated you are about how the money flows, the more creative you can become about understanding which cars to buy, how to buy them, how to turn them, and how to make sure you create investments for yourself instead of liabilities in your garage. Yeah, so also, do you, you know, you know, if, you know, say I wanted to buy a new Ferrari. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say, you know, I want to get a 2015 458, mm -hmm. you know, um, and do you or your company actually buy them for, for, for people now? 
So at Exotic Car Hacks, we help people acquire these cars if they're members, because we want to make sure, one of the big things I wanted to do is not become a car broker, because I was like, there's too many headaches and I don't want to do that. So one of the things we did is we said, if members are going through the course and they learn the concept and they go, I need help acquiring this car because I'm still kind of cloudy and I haven't done this long enough, then we offer a service there that's extremely affordable. It's like a thousand bucks and it helps people have us walk them through that process with whatever car they choose, as long as it fits the model. Now I do that because I want serious people who have taken the course and who are not just like, oh, I want you to do it for me. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, because I, I would get paid a lot more money to do that than a thousand bucks, you know? So the point is like, we are offering only on their first car as a means to helping them make sure they're using. You kind of, you kind of spoon fit in for the first one. For the first one. And then it's like after that, you can kind of run through it. And, and the, the system works really well when coupled with watches and cars, because there's huge margins in making money in watches and there's huge opportunities to drive cars without having the cost. So as an example, like let's say I have an event at the Roadster, right? I bought for 320 grand a year ago and I just sold it for 335 after putting 6,000 miles on it. So that car was driven 5,000 miles for the duration of the first five years, its existence. I didn't own it. Someone paid almost 650 grand for that car, fully loaded. So that depreciation took place, I bought it. I it was in perfect shape, didn't have a single issue. I had my strategies to make sure they don't break down, they don't have this, etc. And then I drove it for like a little bit under a year. I made 15 grand, I got out of it. And I got an event the door literally, and I got paid $1,000 a month to drive it, you know? So, and, and, and you look very cool doing it. Yeah, and it's like, it's okay. Like, it's very passive. It's not like I, I have to sit there every day, like do some kind of work for it. It was like, I bought the right car at the right time, at the right dollar, using the same strategies I teach. And I do this in my own life, right? You've seen it on social media. I always have six, seven new cars, and I'm always kind of getting in and out of my own cars to show people that it works. And every time I'm testing new cars, sometimes I'm like, hey, I don't know if it'll work with this car. So, so I become the guinea pig for it. What, what, are, what are some of the brands that, you know, as far as cars are concerned, I'm, I'm just asking for myself and I just have nothing to do with the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love, I, I was looking forward for you to have being here. But as far as like, what are some, some of the top brands that you can do that with? Everything, as long as it's an exotic. You know, Maserati, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Aston Martin. Doesn't matter. It's, it's more down to the strategy of what years to buy, what options to buy, and what dollars to pay for those cars. Like understanding how to read stickers understanding how much dealers pay for those cars. Not a lot of people would say, well, on the surface, because a car hacks looks like you're saying buy cars cheap, sell them high, but we're not. That's called a dealership. A dealership buys the cars low, sells them high because they're not consuming the product, right? The guy is not driving the car every day for seven months in order to sell it. He's parking it as a dealership and he's saying, I paid 350. Hopefully I make 380. I make some margin on it. We, we in business, right? And we can keep building a nicer building next year. But the way we're talking about exotic car hacks is actually the consumption of the product, right? Which then differentiates the product at the time of sale. Because if you buy a car with 3,000 miles and you sell it with 8,000 miles, there's a significant price difference in a Ferrari that's low mileage, 3,000 miles to a Ferrari that's 8,000 miles. And the question becomes, how do you get that mileage for free? Meaning how do you drive those miles? And that's the big difference. So it's how do you buy it low, still do the driving for the year, and not only lose the time that it would have taken to sell it in like all these, that year, in addition to adding the miles and then gonna exit the vehicle at the same cost or in some cases more. Like There's gotta be a formula to it and it looks like you already got the formula. There's a magical formula to it and, and it changes based on each model, makes, et cetera, but we teach people how to identify the formula for each so they learn how to become asset managers of their own luxury goods. It's crazy because I was looking at you know, four or five eights yesterday. Mm -hmm. and I, was I love that. You know, yeah, I love, yeah. So somebody, somebody said that they're thinking that that's going to be a, a, a collector's car because it's going to be the last normally aspirated yeah. engine for right. Ferrari hat. I agree. So I was looking at them, and um, my God, man, you know, they vary so much. Like, say you were looking at the 2014s, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can see one, you know, with, with 5,000 miles that, that goes as low as, let's say, 220. Mm -hmm. You can see one, the same exact miles that goes as, well, as far as like 270, mm -hmm. you know? And I was just thinking, man, you know, obviously it depends on the option, all that kind of stuff. Why differentiate such a big gap? Well, well stickers, the big difference between a normal car, like if you buy a Honda at the dealership, and let's say you buy two different Hondas, the sticker, the amount of option difference is roughly, I said $3,000 on the whole car versus a Ferrari 458 has over 150,000 yes, miles an option, which yes. is the cost of another car. Yes. So it's like you're buying two yes. 458s for the cost yes. of one, right? 
So what happens is a lot of people go, well, if I buy the cheapest one, then I'm safe because I bought the best deal in the country. And that's where the mistake occurs when buying cars. You're not supposed to buy the cheapest one because the cheapest one isn't the one everybody wants when you go to sell it. So if you, if you understand the formula, then you understand that buying the cheapest is A, almost never the right thing to do, and B, getting the cheapest price is also not the best thing to do because you then lose the relationship with the network that allows you to sell it quickly. So, you know, the 458 100% agree with the idea that it is going to eventually become a collector car. And I think, again, part of this is to understand that your intention with the asset matters a lot too. Like, is the 458 going to be a collector car in a year? No. no. Is the 458 going to be a collector car for 10 years? Probably. So, are you going to keep it 10 years? Yeah. Yeah. Like, if, you get, if you're like me and you get bored of cars every six months, does it make sense to buy a 458 collector grade, put it away for 10 years? Of course not, because I look at it and I'm like, why did I buy this? Like, I don't want to drive it anymore. So I think that's how we have to think about the entire game, right? And a lot of times, again, it, the big mistake people make when going into the exotic car world is they're emotional. They want a car, they go, oh my God, I've always wanted a black Lamborghini, it has to have gold rims. And so they may overlook a lot of things. Will other people want a black Lamborghini gold rims when they sell it? Will other people want this type? What mileage will I put on it by the time I'm ready to sell it? How will I use the asset? So, all of these things come into the game, which does play a big role in ensuring you don't lose money. So now let's go to our my next, you know, favorite topic, which is watches. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you know, all goes hand to hand. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, like, you know, we have to say, you know, I don't like art too much. I don't know too much about mm -hmm. art. I can't never, like, justify paying, you know, a lot of money. Well, watches much. and cars are art. Exactly. Yeah, that's the beauty. Yes. You know, that's it, like, it inspires a, a, a state of what I call Roush, which yes. means that it allows you to survive the real world because you see beauty in the things Absolutely. that you don't exist out there. <laughs> so, so about watches, you know, so I know you have also a program for the watches. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so watch trading is, it goes hand-to-hand -hand with cars because watches are not like cars. Cars go through what you call a time depreciation slot, mm -hmm. which means that over the years they'll drop and then time depreciation will end. Watches drop instantly. So there's new and pre-owned and there's no over time, it'll be worth less. It's just worth less from the moment it's pre-owned. Just like to say, if you drive a car off the lot, it's worth less. That's going to continue depreciating. Not just worth less that day, but the next day, the next day. But the watch is just right, right there. Right then and there. So once it's new or used, yeah. Once it's new or used, it's done. You know. So then, what happens is condition matters. Uh, the other thing that also matters is demand in the long term, like short term exclusivity, etc. There is a much easier formula for watches. And there's a higher volume because there's more liquidity. And so when you think about the liquidity aspect of watches, there's a larger audience for watches than exotic cars. Mm -hmm. And watches can also be played at all levels, $2,000 all the way up to $300,000. So you have a much wider audience, mass market versus exclusivity, et cetera. And as a result of that, you have more trading happening. And when you have more trading, you have faster trade turns. And so there's more liquidity and money being made in margins. So for that reason, the average hold time for me for a watch if I'm trying to sell it is five to six days. The average hold time for a car is 45 days. So I could technically move seven times the amount of watches, you know, in the same amount of time. So I, I think that there's a lot more money to be made in watches and, and it's not really, you can wear it for like five, six years because time does not play a negative role in any way. And supply and demand will determine where values are in the future, but you can predict that very easily based on production level and so on and so forth. So out of all the watches that you have, what is your favorite brand? I'm just asking for myself. So I love this watch. This is one of my favorite watches. What is it? It's the Richard Mille, uh, what they call the Dizzy type. So this was the reason why I love this watch is because I, I love watches that tell a story, not watches that are just like status driven. You know, like a lot of people would be like, I want to wear it 200,000 watch just because. Uh, and I don't, care about that as much. I care about, I think watches are an accessory to men to tell a story about what they believe in. And Richard makes a lot of beautiful watches. They're very popular and they're like higher pedigree of watches that are like 200K or so. And one of the things that happens with Richard watches is that they're about innovation and engineering, which is something very different from other watches that are about tradition. Mm -hmm. So with a lot of their watches, they're about function in F1 or in tennis or in everything else. This is the only watch they did that was actually inspired by a 19th century poem by a French guy called Time. And what was interesting is that it, it, the poem was about how rich people uh, can buy their time, so therefore they no longer need to keep track of it. Yeah. 
And so there's a feature on here, when you press this button, you'll see that the dial changes. So now it freezes time. So the dial every 10 minutes will switch and be completely random. And any time, uh, you can click this button again, and it will have kept time for up to 50 days. So it'll go back to what time it should have been at the time you stopped freezing time. I, is it useful? Absolutely not. Doesn't do shit. <laughs> but it's extremely like poetic, and it just means something. It's also the only watch they built that is a round shape instead yeah, of yeah, a square I'm shape. Thinking. And I don't like square watches, yeah. so it kind of worked for me. So. All right, so you know, if you don't mind, can we use that as an example? Sure. Okay, so if you would have went to a store, I would have bought that. Grand. How much? 120. 120. How much did you pick it up for? 75. 75. And I will guarantee that you would probably can sell it today if you wanted to for it. 98 to 100. So In five minutes. So you just made 23 grand? Like In that. five minutes. If I try to sell it, maybe one cent. Meaning if I stick to it till the right buyer comes. There's not one for sale in the entire country. Wow. Yeah. So for those of you who are listening, you know, he just bought a watch that he can just literally turn around. And I can wear it. The longer I wear it, the more it's worth. Now, is that a rarity or this kind of stuff is available all the time? From, I mean, the margin, 20, 25% all the time. Wow. Doesn't matter you're spending two grand or you're spending a hundred grand. So if you were going to go sell that watch, why would you even list it? I wouldn't. That's the idea of the exclusivity. You see, one of the things you, people don't realize about watches is people want watches. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to try to sell them. People already want them. Right. You just have to get them in front of the people that are willing to pay for them. Got it. And if you, like, would you be a normal person walking down the street, living in an apartment, driving on the Civic, and wearing a 200K watch? Probably not. But if you are you in your, in your performance, in your... G wagon in your 488 and you run into a lot of friends your friends with a lot of other successful entrepreneurs they have watches yeah. they see it on your wrist and they go holy shit i've been looking for one of those i can't find it how much do you want for it give me anything over 100 for it okay then just made 20 grand wow. now if you're not attached to it because i would say you can't be emotional about stuff oh you know that's the only yeah, thing yeah, that's the only emotional. thing <laughs> that's the only thing man you know you know i have offers you know on my 488 and all that kind of stuff and like every time you know, you know, one of my friends wants to buy it right now for me, and I'm like, uh, I, 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 I'm not returning his calls right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm not returning his calls because I'm like, oh, you no. can't. You, you have to realize that things can be replaced. Yes. And, and I get that some things are harder to replace than others, but when you get good at this game, you start realizing that everything has a replacement dollar. Yeah. So you go, if I really wanted one, could I find one for a hundred? Right? Yes, probably. But could I find another one? For seven, probably not. So if I sell it for a hundred, and if I really miss it and hate myself for selling it, I'll buy another one and, and forfeit the profit I made, right? Like and just say, okay, it is what it is, right? And I'll just break even next time, right? But what I'm saying is that the idea is that once you get just attached to the watch, you lose. Once you get a, oh, yeah. once you get emotional to the car anything. and you go, right, anything. Once you, business, you can't be emotional. Exactly. So so you got to look at your assets the same way. And you can't be emotional about money or you lose it, right? You can't. Same when you're making business decisions, you got to have a strat strategic, logical approach to your business. Yeah. And we're so good at doing that, right? Like we're so like, oh, I'm 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 like I'm there. I'm not gonna spend this. I'm gonna do that. But then when it comes to our own life, we're like, oh yeah, like I, I oh my god, I love this house. I'm going to spend 10 times more on this one to live here and so on and so forth. Even though the one across the street might be exactly the same, just slightly different. And you'll make 300K instead of losing 300K. And you're like, yo, but I really want this one. You know? And so what happens is when people become emotional in their lives, then they tend to, as a result of that, make bad decisions around money. And it's the same thing. We're going to say we're talking about someone buying a crib for their child, but they don't have that much money to buy or that they're buying a Ferrari. It's just this, this new mindset of not being a consumer of things and being logical. Well, I know you're author of two books, and I have them right here. Yep. The Third Circle Theory and Radius. Yes. Okay? So I'm halfway done with the Third Circle Theory. You know, if you look at it, it's been in the sauna, whatever. I'm in the sauna. <laughs> I'm in there. That's my sauna it's time. Sweating. Maybe. It's sweat on and all that kind of stuff. Good thing I gave you the hard <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I, I really appreciate that. You know, and... And so on the third circle theory, from what I'm getting, is basically you're telling people just to open their eyes. Yes. You know, basically be observant of what's going on because there's opportunities everywhere. I think the best education in the world is through you paying just attention to what's happening around you. Because I think a lot of people these days, you know, they're just like, you know, they're just not seeing, their eyes are open, but they're not seeing things. 
Right, because this is the, the, the concept of the book is the idea that every human being has a path to being self-aware. And a lot of podcasts, Instagram and stuff always talks about this word awareness, but and they keep mislabeling as self-awareness. They go, if you're aware, you're self-aware. And that's not true. Those are completely different things, right? And I think one of the big things about understanding what the third circle theory is, is that there's an actual roadmap to how awareness uh, evolves within the mindset and enables itself to link to what you see. So every human goes through these three basic or has the capacity to go through these three basic things. Some do not even get past the first one. And it's this a mastery of circumstance, the mastery of society and the mastery of life. And if you try to over skip one, like if you go, I don't like society, I don't care for this. I'm just going to go and master life. You fail. Yeah. And, and you fail because you never really enter a circle. You're just kind of roam around it and you never really can find the, the, the growth you see, you know, and, and my, it's kind of, it's kind of like the guy, you know, winning the lottery. Yes, exactly. Yeah, like he, like he gets all the money, you know, he, like, you know yeah. but he doesn't understand how to manage it within a societal realm. So what happens is he goes, I want to do philanthropy and he runs out of it so quickly. And then he's like, oh, I'm back to being broken yeah. back to the first circle. Same with an athlete who perhaps never really had an upbringing that brought him to work and finance and this and that. And instead went straight to, I'm only playing football and I'm making $20 million. But as a result of that, I never really learned the dynamics of how to function within the realm of someone that made a thousand, 10,000, a million, 20 million. So I just kind of went there and I'm going to quickly fall back down unless I keep educating myself to catch up. Right. And so what happens is I think more people need to be understanding that in an age of information, like we said earlier, there is a huge opportunity for people to get lost in information and they need to be in a position to understand that if they don't pay attention to the, to the map between awareness and self-awareness, then they will lose their self into the realm of other people's awareness. And I think the, the big part with this is the easiest thing to just think of when we think of that is that in an age where information is all around us, like that it's as simple as pulling up your phone and looking at what are you doing this weekend? It's like, well, I can see what you're doing right here on your Instagram. You have access to so much information that if you don't realize where you yourself stand in the information, then you get like sidetracked. You get lost in all the stuff going on. You don't know what to do. And what happens is when there's an information overload, there's a lack of destination. And, and most people don't realize that without a set destination for their life, it is impossible for them, impossible for them to find any level of success. It's like there's a, a ship at sea and you're the captain and someone says, where are we going? Yeah, you don't know. I have no idea. Don't know. Well, by the time you try to figure it out, your crew's hungry, tired, three of them are dead. You know, you, you have, you're, out, you're out of gas. You're done, you know, and, and then you go, well, we've been roaming around here. We'll settle for the first island that pops and that's our destination. And that's the island might be three blocks away from where you left to begin with. And they don't realize that. So true. And I think I heard at one of your interviews that you said that, um, and this is something I always talk about for you to be able to get, to be able to set your destination, you first got to be a little financial free. You know, you can't, you can't be on a rat race. You know what I mean? You know, um, I think a lot of people, you know, this is the, like the best advice I have for, for, for the youth and people who want to be able to do that. If you, when, when I was broke, you know, when I was broke and I didn't know where my next meal was coming from, it was hard for me to make a decision of what I want to set my destination because I was just trying to, I was trying to, I was trying, I was trying to breathe. I was trying to, but once I busted my ass and I was able to, you know, have a home, stable home that I was paid for, have a reliable transportation and not worry about what my next meal was coming from, then I was able to, you know, kind of like set a destination. Okay, this is what I want to do, you know? And, and, and I think you, you said something like that in one of your- one Well, of your the hierarchy of needs, right? Is basically your survival comes before your uh, actualization, right? Like you can't be like, I want to be this spirit. And you know, like, I, I don't even know when I'm going to eat this this week, right? So I think it goes back to the three circles again. You can't get past this life goal without having a circumstantial goal. That's like escaping the circumstance you're born in. And you can't have a life goal without having mastered or the circumstance of society, you know, which is that money does matter, you know, like, and, and I don't mean you have to make a lot of it, but if you don't know how to make it, if you don't understand how it functions, and if you ignore it and say, oh, money's evil, government's evil, this is bad, this is this, then what you're doing is you're rejecting the notion that you are existing here, that you like it or not. Like you drive the roads, you pay the taxes, that you like it or not. 
And the more you argue with yourself that this is bullshit and I don't want to, you know, I don't believe in this and that, you're still functioning within it. So, so you're just denying yourself the ability to understand what you need to be doing to find success because you're saying, I realize that I function here, but I don't care about it. Yeah. And as a result, you're like, well, I want to be Mother Teresa. But it's like, well, you'll realize very quickly that you, you just gave up your leverage to be what you want to be. You know, so as a result of that, you're just going to be stuck very much. Speaking of leverage, okay, I think that's what your, third, your, your second book, Radius, is all about. So, yes. And, well, it's about leverage in the sense that I'm a, people always say, well, should everybody be an entrepreneur, right? And Radius stands and you, and you say no. Well, your answer I, is that no. I'd say everybody should be entrepreneurial. Yes. But not everybody should be an entrepreneur. I don't, I don't think that's... Well, well I, mean, I mean, you know, I wholeheartedly believe that God has created us all different. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I love my cousin. You know, he lives with me. You know, but he's never wanted to become an entrepreneur. He, he just likes to clock in and clock out. That's what he is. You know what I mean? And, and there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do. Well, entrepreneurship is like, however, even though I don't think everybody is going to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is a very big requirement of life. And let me explain what I mean. There's only two types of humans. There's those that are bound by masters and there's those that are bound by mastery. Yeah, love that. There's only two love types. That. They only fall into two basic concepts. Those that are bound by masters are those that seek direction in everything. You know, they need that's structure. Cool. They need, cool. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's actually the third book that's coming after this one. Awesome. So the, the basic concept is that if you're bound by masters, which we all are growing up, and you stay in that master role of obeying a master or having a master, then you're relying on an external factor to guide your direction. And if you're bound by mastery, then you understand that you are the driver and the shaper of your life. So you have to go out there and, and allow your skill, your talent, your mastery, whatever you choose to, to create the boundary of control, which becomes limitless. So for a human to evolve, he has to go from a state of master to mastery, regardless. So when someone denies themselves entrepreneurship, when someone says, I don't need to be entrepreneurial, it's because they think entrepreneurship means I need to have my own company. But entrepreneurship has nothing to do with owning your own business. Entrepreneurship is the art of mastering creativity and excellence. And if a human understands that, then it stops categorizing entrepreneurship in the sphere of a business. Dude, I love that. Which has no I, correlation. I love, I love that. I love but it has no correlation. So if we understand that, then radius is about the ability to understand that Every human being has the capacity to be entrepreneurial and to master their own creativity and excellence. And if they understand how this works, they can A, connect it to a business if they choose to, B, they can connect it to an art, or C, they can create it for leverage to make money out of it. And in exchange, that money will create the freedom and the passion to work on whatever you want. I wanted to be a teacher my whole life and I wanted to do what I'm doing now, you know, talking to you, talking to these people. I wanted to do that my entire life, but I understood that without the leverage. I could never be in a capacity to teach what I want, how I want. I could only teach what I'm told by a master to teach for money. And so in order to master myself, I had to say, I don't like money, but I'm going to go learn it in a bank. I'm going to go learn the ins and outs of it. Because even though I may not believe that money solves everything in the world and money buys happiness and so on and so forth, I believe that money buys the circumstance that allows you to be happy. You know, even though it doesn't buy the direct happiness. Oh, absolutely. But you know, we all come to America because we want freedom. Mm -hmm. And to me, money equals freedom. Well, money buys you time, right? Yeah. That's what it does. Like any time you make, uh, let's say you make $10 million, all you're doing is saying, I made $10 million so I can buy the next $10 million of time to spend it in however way I want. Now, so all you're doing is you're buying your own future. Yeah. You're saying, I, but that's the same thing again, saying you're bound by a master and now you're bound by mastery because you no longer rely on a master to feed you, right? So you go, now that I'm bound by mastery, I have $10 million to fuel that mastery into whatever I want to do. And that's, that's the core element of what we're talking about here is that people don't realize that entrepreneurship has nothing to do with business ownership and hustling. And like they, they watch Instagram too much. You know, like they're like, I'm going to learn how to build a business on Instagram. And I'm sitting there like, what the fuck are we talking about? You know, they're like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur because some guy put a quote on Instagram. And I'm like, Bro, like seriously, like, like do you, I don't think you understand that again, this comes down to the process. Nobody wants to learn the actual process 
that it takes because it takes years. And while years go by like that, people just stay stuck in this space where they go, well, yeah, it's going by like that, it's five years. But I'm like, would you rather be five years of work and you got 20% further in life or five years of work and you're guaranteed you're at the same place five years later? which is technically negative 20%. So because life moved on and you're in the same place, shit ain't even happening, right? So they, they, again, they don't understand this notion of how time plays a role in their life. So they just, again, keep seeking to exchange time for money instead of understanding that they're trying to buy their future time by living in the present, you know? Well, man, that's, that's you know, that's profound. I mean, I mean, I got to go back to look at these. I mean, there's some, there's some nuggets and quotes. Now, I have to ask you this question because a lot of my audience are younger kids now, you know, and they want to become entrepreneurs. We're, we're in the information age. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. You know, I call a lot of them entrepreneurs. You know what I mean? You know, if somebody is out there, they're young, they want to start a company, you know, and they want to become entrepreneurs, what is some advice that you will give them that can kind of hack their process or at least be able to set them towards the right path. Because I don't think a lot of people understand, you know, what comes with entrepreneurship, like you said, the process that comes with entrepreneurship. Everybody's in love with the fact of what entrepreneurs do, but there's a process. Well, the first thing you do is if you asked in the last 12 months, someone or on the internet or your friend, what industry should I be in to be successful? Then don't be in business. Because if you're asking other people, what you should be doing when they don't know your talent, your skill, your opportunity, then it's already fucked. Yeah. So like that's your step one that you need to go back and perhaps learn to get a job, learn to function within the system, learn to obey a boss, learn to have discipline, learn to have excellence before you can have creativity and the things about. It. But if you want to be successful, then stop asking what do I need to do to make X, Y, and Z money? And instead start asking, what should I be doing that I can later turn into something people want to pay me for? So what talent do I have internally that I can keep working at to get so good at that people will want to pay me to do it for them? So how can I monetize my talent rather than how can I seek an industry to make money? And if you can monetize your talent, then that has longevity, meaning you're not going to be in business for three weeks. Yeah. You're going to be in business for 30 years, you know, and you're going to grow off of that and That's branch me. off of I mean, that. I, mean, I always like working out. I love supplements. I love nutrition. That's what I and got into. I monetize. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what the part people don't do, right? I've monetized every single thing I love. I love watches. I love cars. I love helping people. I love uh, teaching. I monetize all of it. And it doesn't, and again, some people will be like, well, that's a negative. You, you're not supposed to charge for teaching. Well, last I checked, the university charges you like 50 yeah. grand Why and they teach you shit, you know? Like, so the point is that if I charge you $100 to be part of something and you learn 10% of what you learn in the school, that's still better, you know, than what you paid for school. But the, the point is, again, because of the predetermined notion people have of how things should work, they typically have the wrong expectation set. And I'll give you the uh, final, very clear example. Let's say you meet a girl and you're really excited about, you know, like this girl, like you're, you think she's everything you want. But in your head, you have a predetermined notion of what love looks like. You go, love is walking on the beach, holding hands, it's having breakfast in this five-star hotel. That's your head, right? You're like, this is what I want. You're not gonna allow love to take its place with this person unless it looks like what you expect it to look like. So you're not allowing the experience to guide the outcome you're expecting the outcome to guide the experience. And I think that's why so many people fall out of love with themselves and what they do. It's because they had a predetermined notion of what it should have looked like. So true, nobody, nobody, can, nobody knows that right. until you do it. So what are you working on that's exciting? What is right now, you know, obviously you have your books, you have your programs. You know, you're doing, you're doing everything you love. You have, you know, all the cars and toys and you're, you, you know, you're living the American dream because you have everything, but you also are living with your passion, everything that you do. What else, what else are you working on? I know you said the third book. So there's a final book coming out. Uh, it's going to be a really important book. So together it'll create the ultimate path to being a human. I think that people just have not hacked into how to be a human. So I think the three books together will really give birth to that for, for people. And I think the huge success of Third Circle Theory has 
allowed me to understand that there is an audience out there that wants to better, not just themselves in the sense of making money, but themselves in the sense of becoming better as individuals. And I think that the third book will kind of bring it all together so people that couldn't connect the dots between entrepreneurship and creativity, and instead we're looking at entrepreneurship and business, will be able to now clearly see that path with the final uh, edition. So that's like my most important project this year. Uh, and I plan to actually finish almost all my businesses in 2020. So I can actually 2021 focus on strictly going out all over the United States and the world and only talking about these three books and no longer working in any of my other businesses. So I have a plan in 2020 to completely back off of all of my businesses, you know, and really give birth to just focusing on what I've always wanted to do, which is give people a path to being a higher human. You know? Well, man, I mean, I'm blown away. I'm blown away with everything that you said today, all the content. Now, PJ, for people who haven't, you know, heard from you or don't know where you are, what can they, you know, um, find more information about your courses, your programs, or, or um, all your books? So I think the easiest thing you can do is you can go to learnfrompj.com. It's the simplest place where I always have kind of a link to everything I do. And one of the things I say is, uh, you know, you can follow me on Instagram, I create millionaires. You can follow any of my companies that seek rounds for et cetera, on there. But one of the things that I recommend people do more than anything else is do, before you reach out to someone to mentor you, before you reach out to someone to take their course or even take a course or learn something, investigate why you want to learn a trade or skill, right? And if you think there's value in learning that trade and skill, then go into it with an open mind and willingness to learn it. Even if you don't understand specifically what the concept is. That's the idea of learning, is if you knew what it was, you wouldn't be learning it, right? Like, so going into it, you have to keep an open mind, but it comes from an element of trust. And so if you don't do your research on the people that mentor you, if you don't do your research on the people that you want mentorship from, then you're never going to be able to accept the information you receive anyways. So it is always best if you're gonna learn something to do your own research, Google people, listen to more than just this podcast, learn more about the people. And if they share a common view and you would trade places with them in a heartbeat, then those are the people you wanna be learning from. Even if you may not like the way they're marketing a product, even if you're not liking the way they're talking about something and it's not in agreement to how you feel, you still have an opportunity to then investigate that product. Wow, well there you have it guys. PJ Kadimi in the house, an immigrant who came to the United States with a single mother, you know, busted his ass, utilized every minute, started making money, started investing money, became a banker, and then started multiple businesses that are now, or <laughs> multiple businesses that now created many multimillionaires. And make sure you check him out. And also make sure that you share and subscribe, you know, this podcast.